started a series last week, Power of One, and I spoke to fellowship. And so there's power in one. There's power. Power of one. And because Adam sinned, we all are now born into this fallen state. And everybody knows now, right? You, you know how to find a fallen state? Just go into Genesis 3 and look at what God told Adam and Eve. That's the fallen state. If you think about it, every, every sin is rooted in that fallen state. Because why? They came out of fellowship with God, right? Today, we're going we're gonna to look a little bit at his presence. But even more so, we're going to look at covenant. Power of one. And I'm going to speak to the covenant how many of you know that we are in covenant with God? Okay, so what happens is, especially in today's church world, is everybody wants the presence. Everybody wants the prophetic word. Everybody wants to bask in his presence. But very few people want to walk away in covenant with God. So true fellowship not only requires presence, but it also requires covenant. Amen? Amen? Covenant. Tell your neighbor, covenant. Okay? So, so we understand just out of Romans 5, 17 that there's power in one. One man named Adam caused us all to be born into a fallen state. But one man named Jesus pulls us out of that fallen state. Amen? And so we were created for fellowship with him. That was, is, and will always be his original intent for our life. I want you to understand that before anything, before you ministering the gospel, he wants you to be in fellowship with him. Before becoming a pastor, a, pre, you know, a preacher, a teacher, uh, uh, an evangelist, an apostle, a prophet, what, whatever the case, case is, he wants you to be in fellowship with him. As a matter of fact, he will not call you from the place you're at unless you are in fellowship with him. That is not just his presence, but as well in covenant with him. See, we need to be in his presence and with his covenant. Amen? And so I'm hoping to, to help you with that today because I think it's extremely important that we understand the greatest manifestation of fellowship is to become one with him. How many of you want to become one with the one? What does it mean to become one with the one? Well, that simply means to walk out your original intent in him. Because your original intent is what he planned for you in his heart, is what he planned for you in his mind, is what he has written in the book of life. How many of you know he says he will write his word upon your heart? So where do you think the book of life is? It's in his heart. Amen? And what the, the word became what? Flesh. Who, and, and Jesus is his what? His only begotten son. Where did Jesus come from? His heart. His heart. His heart. And so the power of one is seen throughout the Bible. Adam caused the fall. And then we see that Noah, one man, was found righteous. God is always looking for that one man. The Bible says he searched the earth for that one man. When he searches the earth, will he find you? Because I believe that he's searching the earth right now. And he's looking for a remnant that he can find favor and grace in his eyes for. Just like with Noah, he's looking for that remnant. Amen? And so God, how many of you know, God removed Adam and Eve from his presence. But then with Noah, he reintroduces his presence, right? The ark, right? When he's building the ark, you have to understand he's building a place to hold his presence. So he's reintroducing his presence. But, but now, now he reintroduces his presence. But the only way that he's going to be able to get in his presence and carry his presence is if he does what? He obeys God. And so true fellowship is to not just be in his presence, but to even go from his presence with him, which would mean you're in covenant with him. Amen? <laughs> Genesis 6, 18 to 22. I just want to show you here. But I will establish my covenant, solemn promise, formal agreement with you, and you shall come into the ark. So come in, how many of you know the Ark of the Covenant? Presence, 
and covenant. Amen? You know, you know who told me that? My son, Zachariah. He came into the room while I was studying last night. He was looking at and he said, Dad, is that like the Ark of His Covenant? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, so Ark is presence and covenant is what? And so I began to explain. I don't know where he's at, but I began to explain it to him, right? And, and, then, and then my 17-year-old son put all the puzzle pieces together for me because he came in the room and he saw the example. And from the example, he got revelation. Are you an example to your children? Do they see you worshiping the Lord? Do they see you studying the word? And then they, do they see you follow through with that word? Or do they see something else? Amen? Come into the ark and your three sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. And of every living thing found on land, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of fowls and birds according to their kind, of animals according to their kind, of every crawling thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is edible, and you shall collect and store it, and it shall be food for you and for them. Now what is God doing? He's inviting them into his presence, and he's also giving them dominion. Because he's telling them to bring of everything that he created. To bring of everything that he created that's good for them. So God, God is not just re-inviting them into his presence, but he's also completing his covenant that he made with Adam as he invites them into his presence. Amen? So I, I want you to see that because, sometimes, you know, we want to be in the presence of God and we want the promises of God. And as you can see, He's offering it to Noah right here. But how many of you know that that's going to require something? That's going to require something. Let's go to Genesis 7-1. 7-1. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you with all your household. How many of you know the Bible says, for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. For you alone I have seen as righteous, doing what is right before me in this generation. You see, Noah figured out a way to be in right standing before God. Have you figured out your way to be in right standing before God? Let's go to verse 23. God destroyed, blotted out, wiped away every living thing that was on the surface of the earth. Man and animals and the crawling things and the birds of the heavens were destroyed from the land. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained. Listen, when God reintroduces his presence in his covenant, it's like an alliance that's likened to a marriage. It's like an alliance that's likened to a marriage, a pledge, a commitment. In other words, do what I ask the way I ask in fellowship with me, and I'll protect, provide, and prosper you and your family. Many of you are praying for your family right now. Today, you're going to hear the mystery of what you need to do so that your family can get saved. You, you're waiting for prodigals to come home. I'm telling you the mystery is right here in what Noah is doing. Amen? Genesis 8.1. Because God's going to remember his promise. And God remembered and thought kindly of Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God, doesn't God promise that he will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you? This is the same concept right here. So, and God remembered and thought kindly of Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the land and the water receded. You see... We get scared of wind, but maybe God's trying to recede some water that has built up in the spirit realm in your life because he's looking to give you land. He's looking to give you territory. Amen. Let's go to uh, 15 to 17. And God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing from all flesh, birds and animals and every crawling thing that crawls on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So this is a promise of God. 
So he's telling him, bring everything out that I told you to bring in. In other words, everything that I told you to take dominion of and bring it into my presence, now I want you to come out of my presence with it, out of the ark with it. You hear what I'm saying today, because I'm taking you somewhere, amen? That they may breed, go back, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Isn't that what he told Adam? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Are you, are you, are you hearing what's going on? God removed Adam and Eve from his presence, and now he wants to destroy the earth, but he finds one righteous man, and everything that he promised to Adam and Eve, he is now promising to that one righteous man. One, the power of one. It may only be you that's saved in your family, but there's power in your one. There's power in your one. Amen? Amen? Don't be religious with your family. <laughs> All right, come on. So Noah went out and his wife and his sons and their wives with him after being in the ark one year and 10 days. You need to spend time in his presence. Some of us don't tarry in his presence. Every animal, every crawling thing, every bird, and whatever moves on the land went out by families, types, groupings from the ark. In other words, when, when, Noah, yeah, when Noah and his family followed the instructions of the Lord, the earth and the creatures of it followed in order behind him. Doesn't the Bible say that the earth cries out for the manifestation of the sons of God? So Noah is told, come out of my ark, come out of my presence. And all of a sudden, the creatures of the earth begin to follow him in orderly fashion. I've been on a safari. I don't get out the truck. <laughs> Those animals are real and they're big. You know, you look at them on TV and they look big. In person, they look bigger. As a matter of fact, they don't look, they are bigger. And so I can only imagine a lion. So think about that. What, what is it that you've been trying to get away from? What sin have you been trying, the, what fruit of sin have you been trying to get away from? You can't get away from it because it's rooted in your fellowship with God. And the more fellowship you have with God, the less fruit of, of not fellowshipping or sin you have in your life. Right? So what is the giant in your life? Because this is what God is saying this morning. Come into my presence and tarry. And when you leave my presence, every giant in your life will follow you in orderly fashion. In other words, they have to be for you and no longer against you. In other words, they have to follow the order of your footsteps instead of the orders and assignment that they've been given to by the enemy. Because you have to understand by this time, the animals were in a fallen state too. So number one, for them to gather and come to Noah required supernatural presence. We need his presence. Now, for them to follow him orderly, we need to obey God. The fruit of sin follows whatever you're following because it's, it's a root. It's a root. The fruit is connected to a root. So the question is, have you been in his presence enough to cut off the root of the enemy and burn it away or not. Because when you burn away the roots of the enemy, that's how he turns that which is bad to good. That's how he causes your lack to become plenty. Because he takes the very lack uh, when it's connected to the root of Jesus Christ uh, and he blesses it. He causes it to bring increase. Uh, he causes that which was least uh, to become the greatest. Because it's all about what you are connected to. And our connection needs to be true fellowship, divine fellowship, his presence and his covenant. You can't separate the two. And I believe that today in the church, we have separated the two. We put the onus on God. We put the responsibility on God. 
When the reality is, is once he releases it on the earth, it's already done. He's just waiting for us. Because what is he doing? He's speaking what's on the earth for you. He's speaking from heaven for what's available to you on earth. Your covenant will declare whether it's released on earth, not, not your presence. See, we come into his presence to see what's in heaven for us, to hear what's in heaven for us, to get the instructions on how to get what's in heaven for us. But it's in our covenant, the obedience to what we see, to what we hear, to the instructions that we receive that will cause heaven to come on earth. The animals followed Noah in orderly fashion. It says in family types and groupings. Creation saw the manifestation of a son of God. And it lined up with him. Now people talk about speak to the earth and the earth will vomit things out. It's the same concept. It's the same concept. Amen. So number one today. Genesis 8, 18 through 19, one waited on the Lord. Before moving forward to carry out his fellowship with the Lord, Noah waited on the Lord. He was in the ark for a year and 10 days. That's a long time. So Noah went out and his wife and his sons and their wives with him. I already read this, so you get the concept but right here we see in Genesis 8, 18 through 19, uh, that God knew that Noah had waited on him. Every animal, every crawling thing, every bird, whatever moves on the land went by families, types, groupings from the ark. 19. Oh, 20. Sorry. No, it's only 18 and 19. So in his presence, we receive his heart and his commands to go in covenant with him. So you don't have true fellowship. Just in his presence. I know that's what we've probably been taught. Fellowship is his presence. But I want to introduce to you today the concept that you can be in his presence for the rest of your life. But if you have no covenant with him, he doesn't owe you anything. You've just figured out how to manifest his presence. But how many of you know people know how to feel? Has anybody ever come up here and felt goosebumps? Has goosebumps done anything for you lately? Because you got to go and you got to follow the word. You got to obey the word. You got to fight for your word. Right? Barry got a word that he would have a business. Right? So the question is, is he fighting for that word? Is he praying for that word? Is he looking for that word to come to pass? Or is, or is he letting the obstacles of today stop him from the destiny God has for him? Because we can, we can quickly forget what God has told us when obstacles come before us. We can quickly, have, have you ever, um, anybody drive to New York from Florida? So, you know, when you're driving to New York, right, that's a long ride, first of all. <laughs> Last time I did that, I decided I'll never do it again. <laughs> but, but there comes a point where you start seeing a haze that's over the city. You don't see the city yet, but you see the haze. And it's really loomy and gloomy. Like it's really, it, it's, it'll, it'll, if you look for it, it'll kind of like, whoa, right? Because what is it called again? The fog, right? That, that fog is real. I think it's pollution though. It ain't a fog. A fog is natural. Smog. Thank you. Man, you from Puerto Rico, bro? Come on, baby. Come on. It's smog. Right? Because it's pollution. And this pollution just sits over the city. Right? So, th you gotta, so think about this. Whatever God promised you, heaven is sitting over it and waiting for you to pull it down. It's real. It's re Listen, that smog is real, but when you're in the city, you can't see that smog. When you're in the city, you see clouds, 
The clouds look real far away because of all the tall buildings until you come to Florida and you see clouds right there. Which, by the way, the altitude in New York is higher and yet the clouds look further away. And here it's lower and the clouds look closer. See, it, it's all your perception because there's nothing for you to, to gauge or to compare the cloud to here so it looks closer, right? So when you remove all the obstacles out of your life, heaven will look a little closer to you. And how do you do that? By becoming one with him. That's how you do it, by becoming one with him. Amen? So we've got to become one. Isaiah 40, 31 uh, speaks to those that wait upon the Lord, right? Those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles. So, so it's, I like this version because it says, because a lot of people are looking for eagles' wings, but that's not really what you're going to get. What, what's going to happen is you will, they will lift up their wings and rise up close to God like eagles. You have wings. See, because in his presence, you get closer to God. In covenant, you're with God. Now, I don't know about you. I like to be in his presence, but I'd rather walk with God. I'd rather walk with God. Rising towards the sun, they will run and not become weary. See, if you're weary in God, you're not running with him. You're running on your own. You've got to become one with him because then you will walk and not grow tired. Then you will walk and not grow tired. My wife and I, we're busy, but we're not tired. We're not weary because we're walking with him. Because we've learned how to come into his presence. And when we walk out of his presence, like Noah had to walk out of his presence. You see, when you walk out of his presence and you begin to obey what he's told you to do, everything else has to line up with you. So you don't get tired because everything's following you. What does the Bible say? Miracle signs and wonders will follow those who believe. See, you're chasing the miracle that should be following you. That's what people do, man. The prophet's coming. I don't like the local church, but when the prophet comes, oh, I go running. I'm running. I'm running. And then before I walk into church, Father, forgive me of all my sins. Let the prophet not see me, but let him give me a word. Because everybody wants his presence, but we don't want his covenant. And true fellowship is to be in his presence and walk out of his presence with him in covenant. That means to obey God. We've got to obey God. Amen? <laughs> Waiting on the Lord reveals one's need for God. And it results in covenant. See, when you don't wait on the Lord, what you're revealing is that you don't need God. So waiting on the Lord reveals one's need for God. Resulting in a covenant, an alliance like into marriage, a pledge, a commitment with him that can only come by way of fellowship. Matthew 5, 3 says, blessed, spiritually prosperous, happy to be admired are the poor in spirit. That right there, poor in spirit, means it doesn't mean you broke. Whoever came up with that revelation was in hell. They weren't in heaven. You're, you're laughing, but some of y'all broke. And you think it's God. And it ain't because he became poor so that you could be rich. That this poor in spirit means that you know you can't do nothing without God. It means that you know that your spirit has to be connected to God's spirit. Otherwise, you can't do nothing. That's what this means. In other words, you'll never have enough of God. So what are you doing? You're always seeking his presence. What are you doing? You're always hungering for his presence. What are you doing? You're always thirsting for his presence. And, and you don't just hunger, thirst, and seek his presence, but you also leave his presence ready to obey him so that you can walk out your covenant with him. God is not responsible to give you anything unless you are in covenant with him. True fellowship is both presence and covenant, not just presence. 
That's why you have a lot of people waiting on things. Number one, they might not be seeing right. See, because faith begins where the will of God is known. Where are you going to find his will? You're going to find it in his word. And you're going to find it in his presence. Because the word became flesh. You have access to God because of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I've got to go so that the comforter might come, the greater one. So who, who's the greater one? The spirit, right? And so then the spirit comes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, so when the spirit comes, the spirit is the manifestation of his word. So what he's showing you is his rhema word. What he's revealing to you is his rhema word. So if you want to know his will, you have to have a relationship with his spirit. You are poor in spirit if you do not have a relationship with his spirit. It says those devoid of spiritual arrogance, those who regard themselves as insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, but now and forever, it, both now and forever. In other words, you know that you're nothing without God. You know, see, true fellowship is being in his presence and then obeying him because you know that there's no other way. True fellowship is coming in his presence and waiting as long as you need to wait for him to give you the instructions he wants to give you. That's true fellowship. Because you don't go on your own. You go by what God tells you. Amen? See, this guy, Noah, waited on the Lord and his family was with him. And so was everything else. Think about that. The key here is that they moved from his presence with his presence, adhering to his commands. That's covenant, and that's true fellowship. In this house, we're the ones who wait on the Lord. Noah waited on the Lord. Noah waited. You know, you know the Bible says that he found land and still didn't come out until God told him to. Sometimes you'll find what God has you looking for, but that don't mean it's time to get into what God has you looking for. The Bible says it. Could you imagine that? You in this ark for a year and 10 days, but for five months they were already on land and they couldn't come out. See, some of you know you're called to ministry and you're trying to come out before your time. The process will help you. I'm going to preach on that on Thursday when I open up Esther's. You know, ladies, ladies, you can't have an Esther unless you have a king. And kings, you can't have an Esther unless you open up your ear. Just saying. All right, number two, Genesis 8.20. Genesis 8.20. Let's, let's, let's finish this. <laughs> one built an altar. So, so one waited on God, and then he built an altar. And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every ceremonially clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, now, the thing that really intrigued me about this is, number one, God didn't ask Noah for, for an offering. Noah knew. He didn't say, Noah, when you get out of the ark, build me an altar. He didn't say that, right? So Noah comes out the ark and, and creation is completely submitted to him. Man, that must feel good, right? No, he comes out the ark, and everything is following him. And it ain't just following him. It's in order. So I'd imagine that the lion was close right behind No, because, you know, they, they high on that pecking order. And they were in order. So how many of you know animals even know the order? <laughs> it's just us humans that got to get it right. And so Noah is walking out, and he's got everything. He's got his wife. He's got his sons. He's got his sons' wives. And then he's got every animal. 
And those animals, some of them he must have used to carry the food that he had. And they would just carry and follow him wherever he went. See, God is trying to bring you to a place that what follows you won't impress you. God can't ask you to go into a place until he knows that what's going to follow you won't have you. Noah, in his waiting, moved when God told him to move and then immediately gave a sacrifice. God didn't ask for the sacrifice. He built the altar. And this is, the, this is what is, think about this. Remember, there was only two of every kind on that ark, right? Two of every kind. So now he has to take a clean, a ceremonially clean animal and sacrifice it. That means that he has to take a male without blemish. So number one, what followed him on to the ark was without blemish. Stop trying to bring your baggage into his presence. But number two, he had to give it up as a sacrifice. So can you imagine he only has two of every kind? And now he comes off the ark and he has to give of one of those kind. So how is he going to reproduce? How is he going to get more lambs? How is he going to get more, right, more bulls? Because he's giving of, of ceremonially clean animals. So that means the animals that he knows will please God. But he's giving them and he only has one. Are you, are you, you guys with me? I see y'all thinking your motors are running. Your motors are running. That's good. Praise God. So the ability to reproduce another ceremonially clean animal would be extremely difficult if you didn't have two. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> but Noah gives the sacrifice because he knows he's in true fellowship with God. Noah gives the sacrifice because he knows that God told him, not only will I provide and protect you, right? Right? Think about this. He says, you, you, you have to understand that when he sacrifices everything, even the ability to provide a future sacrifice, he's placing all his trust for him and his family in God. I present to you today. God's request. Are you willing to give it all up so that he'll protect you and your family and provide everything that you need? Because I think that's what's difficult for us. But true fellowship comes from his presence and our covenant with him. Noah was willing to give it all up. Noah was willing to give up the very thing that would provide the next sacrifice. Have you ever been there? I know I've been there. Noah had to give the sacrifice by faith. What did my wife just, she don't know what I'm preaching. She has no idea what's in my notes. The only one who knows is Jaylene because she puts the PowerPoint together. Faith. It is impossible to please God lest you have faith. What has God been asking you for? I know there's some of you here that still don't even believe in the tithe. Yet no one knew to get off of that ark, come out of his presence and build an altar and give a sacrifice. And not just give any sacrifice. He gave of a sacrifice that can lead to future sacrifices. What is God asking you for? What is he asking you for? See, he can find many of us seeking his presence, but will he find many of us willing to build an altar? 
So I didn't let them collect the tithe and the offering, and I didn't tell them I was going to do this. But I believe that there's some of you in this place, you've been struggling with the tithe. Because if you give it as a sacrifice, you don't know how the next thing is going to come. But there's an anointing here today. If God can just find one. And I'm not finished with my message, but the Lord told me collect the offering during your point number two. Because I was in his presence and now I'm going to remain in covenant with him. And if I'm in his presence and I remain covenant with him, then I'm in true fellowship. And if I'm in true fellowship and you believe the word that I'm releasing and you do what you've struggled to do. Now, some of you do it anyway. But I believe that right now we need to collect the tithe and the offering, not as a matter of principle, but as a matter of fellowship. Because it's in fellowship. I'm telling you, it's in fellowship where you find his protection, where you find his provision, where you even find everything you need for your family. Everything. Noah was sacrificing everything. Placing all his trust in God. Let's go to Genesis 8, 21 to 22 while you prepare your tithe and your offering. It says here, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, a soothing, satisfying scent. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground <laughs> because of man. For the intent, strong inclination, desire of man's heart is wicked from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done while the earth remains seed time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer and day and night shall not cease might I might I tell you today that it's in his presence that you sow and when you come out of his presence that you reap So as you prepare your tithe and your offering today, listen, don't, don't make this your regular thing. I'm, I know that there's some of you that are struggling with this. There's some of you that you, this is what you do because you've already seen the goodness. You've already have the revelation of the Lord. And so for you, don't, don't remain comfortable. Give a little more today because of the revelation. Amen. Don't, don't, you know, it's real easy to make the decision that you always make. The question is, will you hear God today? And will you allow him to tell you what he wants you to give today? Will you do what he asks you to do today? Because all it takes is one. All it takes is one. You see, up to this point, maybe... You've been living right. Things have been following you in order. But there are some things that you have need of. There are some things that you're still waiting for. And God wants you to know today that if you walk in true fellowship with him, in his presence, while walking out his covenant, it will please him. It will be received in heaven like a sweet aroma. That's the power of a sacrificial seat that comes from fellowship. God will never curse the ground nor destroy any living thing in your life. How many of you are tired of walking in the curse? Man, I don't want to walk in no curse. I used to, you know, it didn't matter what kind of car I bought it was until I broke the curse. And do you know I was able to tie that back to a witch who told me every car I ever have will be destroyed? Over there on, on Crystal Lake, right? Crystal Lake is off of um, Curry Ford. I don't know where that's at. There's a witch that lives back there. I was just, I was just, she's the one who told me that where I would find my wife. Witches know. I know y'all think witches don't know. They hear the spirit. Don't get caught up with no witch. But that which, because I had broken somebody's heart, terrible, right? And that which told me, you know what? You're going to break her heart. And because of it, 
every car you own from this day forward will be destroyed. And you know, you forget about those things. You know what I'm saying? Well, maybe that never happened to you. I, I, maybe I'm just the only weird one. <laughs> and then I got saved. And the Lord reminded me of that curse. And you know how I broke that curse? By giving. By, by building an altar and laying down a sacrifice. And now my cars don't break down. Now, I don't got no problem. As a matter of fact, they take my car to get an oil change. I don't even got to take it. Huh? Because it's a blessing. Because what he tried to curse me with now blesses me. You know, see, I, I, I don't need to, I live this. I don't need to hype you up. I just hope that you believe me. Because it'll only follow those who believe. What The words that I'm releasing right now will only follow those who believe. Because I'm not releasing my words, I'm releasing his words. And these words will release miracles, signs, and wonders for those who believe. So if your tithe and offering is ready, and you know that I don't do this often, I actually like to collect the tithe and offering before I preach, so I ain't got to deal with it, to be honest with you. But when the Lord tells me something in his presence, I've got to walk out and covenant with him. And so I believe the Lord wants to break some curses today. And if you have are under the sound of my voice and you're willing to, and you've built that altar, you know where your altar's at right now? Right there on that piece of paper. And if you got a phone where you're giving, then I want you to come and tap that, that pot right there pot as in a, a soil of pot you know I want you to tap it because I'm telling you God is going to break curses today there is ground that has been spitting up curses on your behalf and God's going to reverse that curse there are things that could not come to you that God is going to break that which is holding it and they're going to come to you now that's what the Lord told me this morning. He's reintroducing his presence so that he can lead you into his covenant. And then what he decreed over Adam will come upon your life. Now, if you're ready to give today, if you're ready to walk out in covenant with God, I want you to stand. Because I'm going to release a prayer over your life. I'm going to break that thing off and I'm going to declare and decree God's original intent for your life. Hallelujah. Come on, just lift up that envelope, lift up your phone, whatever. Lift up the check in your hands, the cash in your, whatever it is. Lift it up and if you don't have to give. I left my cash at home, but if you don't have to give, just lift up your hands because God will give seed to the one who wants to sow and if there's somebody next to you who maybe doesn't have their hand lifted but they want to sow and you got a dollar in your pocket just give them that dollar so that they can sow something today that's how much I feel that this is real today that's how much I believe that God wants to break the curse over your life you see God was just looking to destroy the earth but he found one man that was righteous I believe in this room there is favor and grace being found in the eyes of God for many of you. And as you sow today, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I declare, Lord, that the same words you spoke to Noah when Noah built the altar, the same words where the ground would no longer be cursed, nor would you destroy every living thing on the ground. I declare right now that any curse over the lives of the people is broken, is cut off. Now I speak to the earth and command the earth to 
vomit up that which is owed to your people I declare that every living thing not only will it live but it will be reversed to bless them it will be reversed to bless their family it will be reversed to bless the generations to come father I release blessings upon them I declare that they will be fruitful they shall multiply and they will fill the earth just like you did with the sons of Noah you will use your people to fill the earth and as they give a sacrificial offering today as they give their tithe today as they give more than what they would have normally given Lord you know the motive and you know the hearts those that will come into your presence and then walk up here with you in covenant and give what you've placed in their heart I declare the curse is broken now in Jesus name come on bring your tithe and your offering if you got a phone come and tap whatever you need to do come on bring it right now hallelujah come on Turn me to Genesis 9. I've got two more scriptures and then I'm going to bless you. Because that's not everything that God wants to do today. He wants to do more. Amen. Genesis 9.20. Genesis 9.20. Praise God. You see, one waited on the Lord, an altar, and gave us an extreme sacrifice. And one remained in and with God. And I want you to understand one remained in and with God. His three sons were fruitful, multiplied, and filled all the earth. It says in Genesis 9.20, And Noah began to farm and cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. I want you to know today that when you're in his presence and you reveal your covenant to be true and faithful, he pleases to increase your least on the earth. He pleases to make your small beginnings to become the greatest. That's what fellowship does. See, the Ark of the Covenant, His presence and His covenant, when you obey in His presence, He brings you blessings. After everything, I mean, you have to understand this. God uses His sons to fill the earth. God wants to use what He has blessed you with to fill the earth. God, he... There are so many blessings that God wants to release in your life for the purposes of filling the earth. But you've got to learn how to tarry in his presence so that when you walk out of his presence, like Noah walked out of the ark, you can be with God. You can be in covenant with God. You will do what he asks you to do. You will release what he's asked you to release. You will say what he asked you to say. You will do what he asked you to do. That's divine fellowship. That's the fellowship that he's looking for. And I believe that there's only a remnant on the earth that will do that today. The Bible says that even the elite, even the elite will be fooled. Even the elite will fall. Even the elite will think it's okay to do what God hates. And you're seeing it today. You're hearing about it today. With all this social media, you can't do nothing without getting caught. People know. Noah builds an ark and everybody mocks him. Noah is in an ark for a year and 10 days. He's on land five months before those year and 10 days are up, but he doesn't leave the presence of God, the ark until God tells him to and when he leaves he does it in the order that God tells him he walks out first his wife is there his sons his son's wives and then every animal every creature every living thing that was on the ark that had followed him into the presence of God begins to follow him out of the presence of God and Noah immediately what does he do he gives a, he builds an altar and he gives an offering he begins to please God he begins to walk out his fellowship with God 
True fellowship is going to be revealed in how you live. True fellowship is going to be revealed in what you do next. True fellowship is going to be revealed in your marriage. True fellowship is going to be revealed in your family, in, your, in, in the way you handle what the earth spills out towards you. That's where true fellowship is going to be revealed. And God is looking for a remnant right now. I'm telling you, he's looking for a remnant. He wants to fill the earth. We're in the end times. And God sent his only begotten son that not even one would be lost. And we're so busy about ourselves instead of busy about the things of God. We're so busy to go get a word, but we're not busy walking out that word. We're so busy to go see a prophet, but we don't do what the prophet tells us to do. Every prophet that releases a word doesn't just release the blessing. They release what you need to do. We've got to get to the place where we will do what God asks us to do. We will finish the assignment and remain humble. See, that's the difficult thing right now in Christianity is people get the assignment. They walk out the assignment well. They look like they're fighting the good fight of faith and then they fall because they're unwilling to go back and cultivate that first thing, their first love with God. I, I was a, when the Lord began to show me this out of Genesis 9 20 and Noah I mean and Noah began to farm and cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard you know what that's telling us that Noah went back uh, to his original roots uh, Noah went back to the place uh, where he was in fellowship with God uh, Noah went the assignment was over and Noah was willing to dirty his hands uh, Noah was willing to serve his family Noah was willing to cultivate the ground Noah wasn't on a on a high place he was right there on the earth willing to go back to his first love and that amazed me Jesus came to serve not to be served and people get in an assignment today and they want everybody to run around like little rascals for them when we're sons of God Noah went back to cultivating the ground God wants you to get back to cultivating your heart because there's a vineyard in your heart that's going to produce rivers of living water <laughs> he wants you to get back to planting his seed in your heart so that you can produce from the vineyards of heaven where there's good fruit, eternal fruit. After everything Noah did, he went back to cultivating the ground. That ground is your heart today. And God is asking you, will you get back to fellowship with me? Remember when you first met God? Remember that? Man, God was reminding me when I first met him. He was reminding me when I lived over there by Morse Park. And I had this, this room that was my office. And I would just go in there in the middle of the day. And I would just worship him and worship him and worship him for hours on end. I mean, I would just stay in the dark. But I was in the light. <laughs> he just began to show me. Brian, I just... I'll give you the assignment, but will you stay in that first place you met me? And I just, I just began to remember so many things that he's done for me. What has God done for you? He did it while you were in that first place. He did it while you were humble and you were seeking his presence. He did it when you made the time to read his word. He did it when you made the time to make sure your life was aligned with his word. It wasn't the law. It was the love of God that was on the inside of you that caused you to rush up to do the things of God. You didn't struggle to do what he asked. You didn't struggle to be a part of the body. You didn't struggle to hear his voice. You didn't second guess or question him. 
God's calling us back to a place of fellowship where we can become one with him. Think about it. One man whose family was saved, then blessed, and ultimately used to fill the earth. And he didn't have Jesus. We have Jesus. We have the one. The one man that reconciles us to the Father. The one man that caused the veil to be broken. The one man that opened a way into his presence. The one man that said, my blood will wash you clean and will cause you to see my Father again. The one man who causes you to be washed so clean that your original intent is all that he sees. All that he sees. He doesn't see you like you see you. He sees you like he originally saw you when he thought about you before the foundations of the earth. He sees your original intent. He sees who you are in him. Before Noah was found righteous, before the instructions to build the ark, before the animals subject, subjected themselves to him, before his family became one and his sons filled the earth, before all of that, he loved God so much that favor, his presence, and grace, his covenant, is what God found when he found Noah. Will he find favor and grace when he comes looking for you? Will he find his presence and his covenant? Will he find true fellowship? 1 Corinthians 7.24 We must remain humble. When God showed me this scripture, I was just blown away. You see, before I come and minister to you, the Holy Spirit ministers to me. <laughs> Brothers, let each one remain with God in that condition in which he was when he was called. <laughs> Jose, I remember the condition you were in when you were first called. I remember how you would lock yourself up in your house and you would fast for 30 days and you would only come out of your house to go to church and be with the body. And I remember that that was the way you broke off everything that was affecting your life. Every mountain became a molehill and every valley began to get risen up. I remember when you prayed and you fasted for days on end so that your children can come. I remember when you prayed. I remember when you fasted dating women for a whole year. I remembered where you were when he first called you. I, 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 he just began to show me. He didn't just show me Jose, I already told you, he showed me me too. Of course he showed you. <laughs> he showed me my daughter and how much she wanted to come to this church so that she can flow in the things of the spirit. Because when he first called her, she was desperate to flow in the things of the spirit and now she fights them and doesn't know what to do. How many of you said, man, that church, there's freedom, there's the spirit, there's the presence of God, and now you're stuck. God is calling you back to where he first called you from. <laughs> when you were seeking his presence, because that's what brought you here. And that's what kept you here. And it was because you realized his presence that you were able to handle the word that was being released. Because only a heart that's being cultivated in his presence can receive the seed of the truth of his word. Oh, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about today. <laughs> but your fellowship is realized in your ability to remain faithful in seeking his presence and staying in covenant with him. That's the condition where he first called you from. And that's the condition he's calling us back to today many of you I, I know I know this to be true many of you you were searching for a place and then the enemy you get here and the enemy tells you well hold on just make sure 
Well, hold on. Let's be sure about this. Well, hold on now. They might hurt you like the other people hurt you. Well, hold on. They might not do that. Hold on. Right, one? Hold on. They might try to control me because, you know, they're preaching the word a little too heavy. Hold on. But it's exactly what you were looking for. The word that will pierce your heart. The word that will fill you with his righteousness. The word that will fill you with his joy. Because true joy don't come without his righteousness. And true peace don't come without his joy. So you need righteousness to bring you to a place of joy. And joy to bring you to a place of peace. And God is calling us back, Jose. To that first place. To that place where he first called. Remember, Raquel, when you used to beg God for your husband? Do you remember that? When you would be like that woman that go before the judge. Ay, señor. Donde esta mi el pozo? You would even pray in Spanish because I just heard you praying in Spanish. Yep. And you got your husband. God wants you back in that place for everything else he has for you. That's where he wants us. He wants us back to our first love. See, that's where you're going to find the favor and the grace in his eyes. And that's where you'll produce the power of one. That's where you'll produce the power of one. Now, if you want that power, you've got to seek him out like you ain't never saw him before. You got to get back to that place. I know there's a hungry and thirsty people in this place today. The Lord has been taking me on. He's taking us through a journey through Genesis. Next, I'm going to talk about Abraham. I was going to talk about Abraham today. He said, well, you ain't finished with Noah yet. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, well, everybody thinks I introduced covenant through Abraham. I introduced covenant through Noah. He reintroduced his presence and his covenant through Noah. And now he's reintroducing it to you. Will you get in his presence and then walk with him as you walk the earth? If you're there today and that's what you want, I just want you to stand. Just stand up and lift up your hands. We all need to get back to that place where he first called us from. All of us. All of us. And so right there where you're at, you may say, man, every time I come to this church, I got to repent. Well, we live a lifestyle of repentance. Get used to it because he's perfecting us. And when he's perfecting us, he's turning us from our old ways. And we do that by way of repentance. So right there where you're at, I want you to repent. And I want you to commit to God to return to the place where he first called you from that place where we were seeking his presence and doing anything to obey him keeping us in covenant with him father right now i thank you for your people lord as they've repented and as they've committed to go back to that place that place where they first loved you that place where they would seek you like they never sought anything that place where they would just obey anything at a whim they wouldn't second guess you they wouldn't wonder is that God but they would just obey because all they wanted to do was obey you because they loved you that much father remind them now remind them now remind them now of that place Take them back to their first love. Take them back to how they would obey at a whim. Take them back to the spontaneity of their love with you. Take them back, Lord. Take us back. Take us to that place, Lord. Take us, Lord. Take us, Lord. Take us. Come on, just lift up your hands and close your eyes. Take us, Lord. Take us. Take us, Father. Take us, Lord. Take us, Father. Father, we want you. We only want you. We only want you. We don't just want your presence, Father. We want to be in covenant with you. 
We want to do what you want us to do because we love you. Take us, Lord, take us. Take us, Father. Remind us, Lord, of our first love with you. Remind us, Lord. Remind us of how we would seek you out. Remind us, Lord. Show us, Father. Show us the way. Oh, that we would return, that we would return to our first love. Oh, that we would love you like we first loved you. Father! Take us, Lord. I sing it. Yes, Lord. Just take some time. Take some time and love on your God. Take some time in His presence.
Come on, he's touching you right there where you're at. Come on, he's extending his arms around you. Thank you, Father, for opening the doors for true fellowship with you. I declare that the people in this house, the people watching online, Father, that we will be hungry and thirsty for your presence and just as hungry and thirsty to walk out our covenant with you. Father, that we would be in true fellowship with you. I thank you for reminding us of our first love I thank you that you have found favor and grace in your eyes for us and as we go if we would hunger and thirst for your presence if we would hunger and thirst to obey your word to remain in covenant with you oh father you would cause us to be fruitful you would cause us to multiply you would cause us to fill the earth and not only would you bring it for us but you would bring it for our family and the generations to come father i declare that these here are a blessed people a people that are fruitful a people that would multiply a people that will fill the earth with the eternal things of heaven i bless your people and i declare that your face will shine upon them everywhere they go if they go in fellowship with you it shall be given unto them and they and their household their family will serve you all the days of their life I declare it and decree it so now in Jesus' precious name.